Welcome to um, the panel. Uh, I'm not okay. Why? And just to make an announcement, it's okay not to feel okay. So Pastor Holly, Dr. <laughs> Cudley, look, she said, don't do that. Don't copy Dr. Cudley in Jesus' name. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, the uh, sought after um, author, Rhonda Nita. I need for everybody to lay down their credentials. Dr. Holly, you are a doctor. So I just need for everybody to lay, lay down their credentials in case we got some people that, you know, are listening and judging. We are qualified to talk about what we uh, talk about, but it's an open mm -hmm. platform because we want people to interact. And we want them to interact. We want them to voice their opinion. And it's okay. We we don't, no judgment zone. Say what you want to, just be respectful. Dr. Holly, please share. Tell us, you know, what it is that you do, sir, and um, what you bring to the table. I'm a lead pastor um, uh, here at uh, Unity Worship in Cartersville, Georgia. Uh, for the most part, I'm also an author, writer, um, amongst other things. Right. And of course, uh, you are qualified to speak on this matter. You counsel. Am I right about it, sir? That's right. That's right. Okay. And of course, um, so often I call uh, Margaret Conley doctor because this sister is, is the, it fits her. So let's share and, and, and let everybody know what it is that you do. Uh, my name is Margaret Conley and I am a uh, psychotherapist, a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, and so that's that's what I do. I also have a master's of divinity. Uh, I studied the psychology of religion and pastoral care. So I merge both of them. But this is what I do all day, every day. I'm talking about it's it's okay to be. It's very fine for you mm -hmm. not to be okay. Mm -hmm. Just tell somebody so we can do it. We can work on it collectively. Right, right. Uh, I appreciate this open forum. Anita, share around the, what it is that. You do a number of things. You wear a number of hats. Uh, share with everybody what it is that you do. Yeah, um, I'm Rhonda Anita. I am a, the founder of Rose of Sharon, which is a domestic violence organization here in Atlanta. Um, I'm a two-time author, uh, international speaker, and uh, best-selling author. I am also a mother of two amazing boys, and I'm a minister. I'm a life coach, amongst a few other things, a real estate mogul. So I am more than that. I am a servant of God. So I am Amen. here to serve the Father. Amen. And of course, my name is Coach Deb. I am also ordained pastor. I am a life coach and spiritual counselor. So we are all qualified to talk about life. Am I right about it? Amen. Uh, 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 Dr. Holly, you're frozen with that nice smile. He sure is. Thank God. I was, I was trying to figure it out. I can't. Throw. He's frozen. <laughs> it's but a nice look, about. though. It's, it's better that you frozen that way than a way that was going to be really distracting <laughs> <laughs> to be able to move forward. It's uh, a nice smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, though. Okay, so, all right, guys. Let's, uh, we're going to continue the conversation. The conversation is mental health in the black community regarding men and women, okay? We're gonna talk about race, we're gonna talk about grief, okay, in the black community. Because when it comes to grief, I know we all deal with that differently. You know, we got our, it's different traditions, it's different root, rituals and things of that such. It's a lot of time grief is not dealt with. A lot of times when it comes to grief, we put a, a limit, a time limit when we ought to be over it, you know, when it's a process. It's just, I think it depends on the information that you're getting from different people. They feel like you ought to be this way. You ought to be that way. You know what I'm saying? So let's move forward with that one, first of all. And I think it also, it let, let's talk about the mental health of it all. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Rhonda Nita, you just buried your mom. And I remember you mentioning that your mom had mental issues. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how she dealt with that when she was alive and how you're dealing with that knowing that she had mental issues. Does that spark something in your knowing that it's possible hereditary or that you need to do some type of prevention 
yeah, my prevention was <laughs> decre declaring and decreeing over myself that I would not suffer mental illness. Um, I do, in some cases, believe that there may be a sense of um, heredity, um, definitely generational, um, curse-wise, um, on the spiritual level, because there are multiple people in my family that deal with mental illness. Um, you know, growing up, I, I guess, yeah, I would probably have been one considered you know, having some mental health issues myself, um, probably more emotional health breakdown because I attempted suicide three times. Um, I, you know, dealt with depression and um, low self-esteem and all those things. I never was diagnosed with anything. Um, but I, as I, as I gave my life to the Lord, I realized that these were, these were curses that, that were coming to claim my life as well. My mom was diagnosed with, um, she had a couple of diagnoses. Manic depressant was one. And she was diagnosed with that at about 25 years old, between 25 and 27, something like that. Very young, very beautiful. Um, she served our country, um, but there was something off. And our family really didn't know exactly what, um, what was what was going on with her um she was you know really violent and i mean it was just like a, a total different person my mom was one of the sweetest gentlest kind i mean kind-hearted people you could ever ever meet and um she had this beautiful soft-spoken voice but when she was going through her episode um she was completely different so growing up as a child in school I was really embarrassed by it. Um, it was because these these nervous breakdowns or these outbursts would happen in public, and they were um, very demonic. Even if if I can use that to describe some of the things that I experienced, um, but it took many, many, many years for them to get to a good diagnosis from her, from uh, manic depress manic depressant to schizophrenic to um, bipolar disorder. I think that's mm. where she finally ended um, with that title. And so um, I dealt with it my entire, entire life. And um, by the time she, um, my mom passed at 63, so she was very young. Um, but by the, maybe in her late 40s, mid 50 somewhere around there she didn't um she could no longer take oral medication she had to take shots so she had to have a nurse come because if she, if she just stopped taking one pill the whole world was coming down so they had to get her on a medication to make sure that she 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 took it and if you're getting a shot you can't get rid of it so it was a very um it was a very tumultuous upbringing, actually. Um, and, but now, you know, as I grew up as an adult, understood it was not her fault. And it's not something that I need to be embarrassed by, but to share my journey and my mom's story with, with other people. My mom, although she was, um, she struggled with mental health issues, she was extremely smart, extremely uh, brilliant woman. She was loved by everybody that knew her. She went to school, she studied, she was a nurse. She um, she worked at a daycare, she was um, studying. She just got her um, certificate to be a counselor, like a drug and alcohol counselor with her mental illness. So she could live a normal life if she was, you know, um, under medication. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a tough journey. Was is it was it late in the years when she was di finally diagnosed to be able to function and live a normal life? She went a long time without knowing. No, no, she she from I'm saying from from her younger years around 25. That's from 25 to 63. She knew she had mental mental health issues. So it was just they kept changing the name of what she had um based on you know the 
I guess the chemical imbalance in her brain and based on the behavior. So she went through several different diagnoses, but she never let anything stop her from living. She always was a student of life and she always attended school in some type of shape, form or fashion. And um, she could not work a normal job like us for an extended period of time, but she always kept her mind as sharp as she could by going to school. Um, so no, she, she knew she had mental illness from around her early 20s or mid 20s till the time she passed um, this month. Were there any signs in her younger years? Did you ever talk, know your grandmother to speak with her about what it was like for uh, your mother in her younger years? And if, what was the root of that? Was, is it, was it hereditary? Did someone else in the family did have to uh, uh, deal with that? Yeah, we, we have other family members that suffer um, chronic mental illness as well. My um, uncle, my mother's brother, her, her oldest brother, he's manic depressive. So he deals with um, chronic mental illness as well. And so I'm not, I don't know if it, if it, if it has been told that it's hereditary. I can just say multiple family members that, that did have it. And so um, she just managed. And we all managed when we found out it was a problem. Um, before, she was, before she was actually diagnosed, um, I don't know that there was any signs that she had mental illness besides her just being a little different. <laughs> just, she just was a little, she was a little different. <laughs> and and um, I'm different, so that's right. why I laugh because right. Um, at her at her home going, one of her neighbors was telling a story about her walking in, in <laughs> hot tar. And it was her way of saying, I can do it, even though the sign says I shouldn't walk in it. But really, who walks in hot tar? And as she started to walk, she did good and then she slowed down. This is before the diagnosis. So could that have been a sign that something was off and we just, well, I wasn't born at the time, but the family just did not know very well could have been. Um, so when I say she, she just displays some behaviors of being a little off, it would be something like that prior to diagnosis. Okay. All right. Now, Margaret, I'm going to get to you, but I want to go to, um, Pastor Holly, because I want to know his point of view regarding, like, if you, because you counsel in mm -hmm. your church, so where black, well, mental mental illness take place in the black community, and when it comes to the attention of the clergy, how how is it dealt with? Is it looked at? Is it frowned upon as being a bad spirit or demonic? or real issue, you know, because Rhonda spoke about, you know, how her mom was able to function at some point, but you know, sometimes when you uh, start acting different, people want to try to label you. I know why, why, you know, growing up in the church with me, if you were strange at all, it, it was the devil. <laughs> no doubt. So how would you, man, how would you help someone like that how, how do you see that in the black community it's very common this is not an odd situation i think um I mean, everything is the devil amen amen i think um well, can y'all hear me okay because i can't yes we can hear you and we see you smiling okay that that, that is still stuck on that same steel <laughs> yeah okay uh, i guess we'll go roll with it as long as you can uh, as long as you guys can hear me <laughs> I can't, I can't see you guys or anything. I mean, oh, really? Yeah, it's froze up, and I guess the audio is still going through, but that's it. You, you well, we hear you clearly. Okay. You look fine. Uh, Smile. Look fine. Okay. Well, I, I'll say this today, it is very different than it, it probably was 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the general mindset of mental illness um, in the Black church has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, in, a, in, in really in a um, not so long of a time. Um, another thing is, I think the, the Bible is enough. 
religion's not enough. Mm. And that's really important to understand. I believe the scriptures talk a lot about mental illness uh, and different um, struggles that we've, that we've seen a lot of people go through in the script, scriptures. Another big question for me personally that I've been uh, really wrestling to answer best I can, you know, from my, from my position is how much of mental illness is actually unresolved trauma mm. and how much of it is something broken within an individual's thought process and, uh, and different. And, and, and honestly, and to be perfectly honest, I get kind of 50, 50. Uh, when I'm talking to different uh, clinical professionals, I get a lot of clinical professionals who talk about it being unresolved trauma and getting down to the root of what's unresolved so you can actually see people come to some place of healing. Uh, but on the other side of it, you have some clinical practices that's all about functionality. It's not necessarily about healing someone and making someone whole uh, as much as about just getting them to where they can, they can function. Uh, within their own uh, reality and whatnot. So those are questions that, you know, that I'm constantly considering, constantly thinking through, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what is the best way. I know for me personally, there are some situations that I, I can counsel effectively. And in some situations I tell them, you know, I'm out of my league. You're going to have to go talk to a, a professional. You may need some meds to help you cope or help you function. Um, and, and, and that's perfectly all right, you know. So I think, uh, within the black community, it is nowhere near the stigma. There's nowhere near the, um, the the same mindset that it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago in the church. You had no no clue how many people were on meds and psychotics and different things, um, you know, that was at your church. Right. Whereas now that people are a lot more open and more available to talk about it. I think another thing that's really heavy within the black community as well is um, thinking of the right word, the stigma associated with dealing with certain professional environments. Uh, you know, you still have the general, the average black person still is not too pro on being consistent at the doctor. And then if they do, they don't go and ask questions. They don't learn information prior to going in, reading up on medicines, reading up on um, different things that a doctor may be prescribing them and having some sense of their own understanding going into it because there's an intimidation that they go into each, um, you know, each one of these processes with. Mm -hmm. So I think that's still a, a thing that we have to continue to work on uh, and continue to build build people in. But as far as the black community or the black church and mental illness, I think it has grown a lot. Okay, and of course, I love, love your perception. I love your idea rather than you shifting the blame on a force. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, uh, that's that's not healthy. Man, that just stacks, it adds to the 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 the, the fumes, you know, it just it's like what? You you I know can't, I can't count how many couples um that I've spent time with counsel, counseling them. Um, and you have people that come in, you know, with the blame game on, it's a demon and they got this spirit. And, and they and, and, and I almost immediately always take that right away from them because those are really cute explanations and excuses the vast majority of the time to keep people from being responsible for what they can heal in and what they can walk out in their own truth. So uh, a lot of people like to play those games where, you know, it's a spirit and this and that, you know, you, you ain't got a lying spirit, stop lying. You know what I mean? It's just, it's That's not, right. it's not majorly complicated, you know? Okay. Now, from a clinical perspective, Margaret, explain to us your, your perception of the root cause in the black community you know what i'm saying it's the mm -hmm. root of like for instance ronda's mom she mentioned the fact that there were other people in the family that also have the mental illness so how do you how do you find out how do you you know get to the very root of taking care of this 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 matter, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yes, everybody know. Yes, it's always been that way. Yes, we deal with it, we manage it, you know. But there's a root to it, and some people can say it's in the water, it's in food, 
but what is the root to the mental illness in the black community? Ooh. That's a huge question. Um, See, you freezing up too. And I'm gonna <laughs> try, I'm gonna try my best. Uh, I am, uh, the root. Can y'all hear me talking? I can hear Facebook. you, but you, you, you know you don't close with your mouth open. Oh, because well, I, I okay. wish I was like, I should have smiled. Like, I don't look, know. Look, you wish you was looking like Holly. <laughs> 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 Look, he, I mean, he picture perfect, right? <laughs> I don't even look good. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> uh, right. Now I got to You moving now. You moving now. Yeah, okay. And I didn't know if we wanted to stop because it's not playing on Facebook. I try to keep up with comments. Um, it's not playing on Facebook? It says trouble. Sorry, well, actually, we trouble. Uh, Marquita says it is. Marquita says it's playing. Okay, so... I'm just looking at it over here, but but it's all question. good. We, we'll fix that. We're gonna stay in the zone in the in the zone because I love this conversation. So I want your perspective from a clinical standpoint because listening to her story, mm -hmm. what is your perspective? So the, for the black community, yeah, the the black community itself has traumatic experience. I'm. Yeah. I, I am 90%. Uh, well, Holly said he 50 50, and I'm 90%. Maybe because I'm a trauma therapist. But I'm 90% <laughs> sure that if you can get to the root cause of it, you can find out what happened with the break. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what, what happens with the Black family, though, is we carry over with this, this generational piece outside of just, the, you know, it's intergenerational trauma along with historical trauma. So, it's two different reasons, two different things like generational, intergenerational trauma. That is generation. So that it doesn't have to be bloodline. It's a generation of black people. And then you have historical. What historical, about the unresolved that he mentioned? Yeah, it's unresolved. So historical is gonna go to families. Like okay. when we say little Billy just special, we need, to, we need to figure out what happened that let him let him be special. Like right. was special in his food was special and not make that little Billy got it. touched and we don't know little Billy got touched or he was fun. Was was little Billy, you know. I, you know, my in my family, we have a, a relative, and we, my family's pretty honest about what they do. If y'all know my grandmama Marginelle Bees, I mean, she she's pretty. I'm honest. part so, of your family. Yeah, there's a particular, yeah. there's a particular person in our family. It didn't add up, you know, like where the mental illness came from. They had to be honest about her being around a particular chemical, and it altered her brain. My family don't lie about it now, but what we had to do is say, okay, so what what led to you thinking you'd be around this particular with a baby you know like what was going on there so we didn't tackle the mental illness we had to realize it was a chemical dependency going on and so okay. did that pass on through generations at that point like who else is drinking and smoking and using like you know and so we found out where that stopped and it stopped you know like they they cut it short i didn't know at the time that's what my grandmother and her sisters were doing um because my grandmother's twin sister died from alcoholism they wanted to stop it so why did she start drinking come to come back is an emotional break she was right. she had an abusive husband what do we do we want to stop it so black families have a hard time because we want to hold the secret and holding the secret is where it starts passing through to our children's children now if the bible tells you that you're supposed to set up and lay well for your children and your children's children please understand how you laying down the well that means you can set up some curse for them too like you gotta learn how to manage stuff and so when you start to call things out i love i love that runda's mama knew at 25 what was going on yes because she was able to pass that that understanding on and so runda's able to say yeah my mom was special but i'm a little special too but i know i manage it like i because i know who i am because it was passed on here's that generational understanding of passing right so some of us in black community we don't like to talk about little bobby and little johnny acting different because mm -hmm. if we do, then we have to admit what's going on through our bloodline, like what's mm -hmm. going on in our psyche, what what led to that break. Um, and then some of it, that 10% that I believe is absolutely you born that way. Like that was going to happen, whether it was going to happen, whether it was going to happen. Then we need to figure out who else was depressed and anxious in the family. I promise you, you'll find and realize 
oh god my grandmama was anxious all the time we just thought she couldn't drive but she shook the whole time and then here's this anxiety piece and you go back and find out but for black people overall i, I would definitely say it's 90 percent of unresolved trauma we have not dealt with the ramifications from enslavement like we just haven't and we don't really know how but because we live in retention like we say we, we have a lot of big culture yeah but African Americans really don't have culture we have retention from where we we have these spots in these parts um and we rely really heavy in this religious space because that's what we that was what was ingrained in us and so when we seem to look crazy it's beautiful to tap into spirituality like because that's the core of who we are that's what we do know i know that those hymns got me through and they got my ancestors yeah. through they got uh -huh. me they got me over the river and through the woods like uh -huh. i'm gonna keep singing them you know so we, we know that prayer got us through and we know that tapping into that level of spirituality where we can hear God. We don't think that that's crazy and it's not because we're going into this space of meditation, this space where we can literally hear a voice telling us what to do. That In therapy all day, we ask people to go within and can you hear that voice or that inner critic? Well, I, you know, and I encourage people, can you hear God speaking to you? That's not crazy. Um, whereas some people I'm gonna come back and be like, yo, you schizophrenic. Well, no, there's a difference in that break. If you're going within and you can hear this inner critic and you can hear the voice of God, you can hear whatever you need to tap into, that's going to pull you into this understanding of self. Right. Like what is really going on? Um, so I invite our community to ask the question because normally we point fingers and we laugh or we like, we don't hang out with them. But I invite our community to say, what happened to you? when you see something that's different and that it doesn't line up with what you think should look good, because a lot of this is just cover up. Like a lot of us are hurting, probably most of us are hurting, but if I put on some makeup or cover it up and look really nice, then you won't have to experience my hurt with me. That's not communal. That's not even godly. It says, bring it to one another, <laughs> bring it to us <laughs> so yeah. that we can hold space with it. You know, so when we're hurting, the community hurts. Right. And that, that's the whole point of the body, right? So you know bring it but we have been taught hold it don't say anything laugh at little bobby and them but i invite our community to say what happened to you and then we can find out the source of a lot of emotional issue and we can move to a state of emotional wellness now i wish i would ask that question i wish that i would ask my mother what happened to you right I know that um, she doesn't, she didn't like, um, she she was okay with going, when she came and she was okay to go to the Martin Luther King Center, but I know that during that time it was traumatic for her because certain things, like certain movies she wouldn't watch. She would never get her to see um, Jangles or something like that because she did say at one point, I was like, why am I? It's just, you know, it's just a movie. Um, telling it us this, you know, it wasn't just a movie. Well, I'm, I'm, t I'm saying, no, I'm saying to her, it's like, right, right. I was trying to get her to just watch it or whatever, and she's like, no, I lived that, you know. She didn't Welcome live back. that time, but she lived some of that trauma, and she was like, no, she just did not want to um, engage in anything um, from the past as it related to the racism that 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 they dealt with and. You know, where blacks drink water here, and you know, you could all the, she didn't, but I didn't, I really didn't ask that question like, what really happened? How did we get to this place? Because this was so much part of my life that it was normal, it just was how she was, and um, she handled it with grace, but I'm sure she didn't want to be that way, you know, but to ask. What happened? You know something. This is we're gonna move to the racism piece because you you brought up something that very well could have been um, a trigger that that affected your mom because she didn't like to look at the racist type documentaries and movies of such, right? Right. Okay. So, Pastor Holly, speak on that. Speak on. Um, the racist piece, how it affects 
let's just say the men, because I'm going to have Margaret to talk about the women. Uh, I don't know if you meant how much you missed, but Rhonda was sharing uh, uh, because Margaret mentioned the fact that a lot of times we don't ask the question why certain things, certain certain things have certain reasons people act the way they do, you know, regarding a mental condition or what. What was the, what, what happened? Who, who touched you? Or did you get touched or whatever? So Rhonda was sharing that that was something that, that she didn't bring to her mother and ask her mommy what happened, why? So t- talk to us yes. and tell us, you know, how you believe uh, racism plays the abuse of racism and all this ugly, ugliness plays a role in the mental health in the community of the black man. Now, see, Rhonda talked about her mother. I'm gonna get that to Margaret because that that's a whole story with a lot of women. But you tell us on from a man's perspective, you know, because men are walking in fear now. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they 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 walk. They're walking in fear. They're afraid. They, you know, it was froze up again, didn't it? Indeed, but it's okay. You know, you don't look crazy. <laughs> Well, let me let me um, try, try to dive at it um, a little here. Uh, well, one is there's a lot of layers. There are a lot of layers. When you start trying to unpack the damage and the trauma that exists and the trauma that we've experienced from, uh, and racism then becomes a very general term, but you have to speak more specifically to uh, slavery, um, you know, then, you know, uh, failed reconstruction, um, Jim Crow, law, the black laws, all of these have different levels, different levels of actual trauma being enacted upon a, a group of people. That's that's one layer of the actual trauma that is uh, that, that we've experienced. The next layer is our response to the trauma. Then we take on a generational perspective. So you have a people who has to try to teach strength within their family dynamic, but at the same time, try to keep you from being killed or keep you from suffering even even more harm, uh, you know? And so at the same time as trying to build strength and character, you still also impose fear. Um, and, and that becomes very real. So imagine a father uh, who has to teach his son how to survive. And so now he has to literally shape a certain degree of fear in the way he think about uh, himself and how he thinks about his interaction with other people uh, and all of that. So now you're talking about a, a long-term sustained trauma that's constantly happening and it's happening, uh, you know, through generation after generation after generation. So almost, it becomes almost a puppet master, so to speak. And so, but there's no healing actually taking place. You know, um, then when you think about the survival mechanism that we've been taught and programmed in in black culture, you know, we we were never meant to be survivalists. We were meant to be uh, success stories. We were meant to walk fully in the authority that God had set forth for each and every one of us, but because of the success that we're being programmed in, constantly conditioned in, what ultimately winds up happening is we create a level of selfishness, a whole nother trauma, you know, mm-hmm. that we're not designed to operate in, but we're forced to operate in it. And now you have, you know, Blacks who who reach certain levels of success, whether it's financial or our success and, uh, you know, climbing up the ladder, whatever, or what, what have you. But all of it is still very limited in what it could do for the people as a whole. And there's still no healing, still nobody actually sitting down and processing through the harm and hurt these traumas has caused. Now you think about racism and the totality of the conditioning and how most people don't even really understand the levels of racism that they actually operate in and what they've been conditioned to operate, operate in. And this happens to black and white people. This is one of the reasons why we have to be learning and we have to be very intentional on not just becoming uh, a sense of consciousness of people walking around with a pride of how much they know, but you have to become conscious of your your truth and your conditioning so that you can be available to actually heal yourself. Mm -hmm. Even if, you know, it's not a a general sense of healing the need. uh, And and I wish it were, you know, to a degree. Um, 
but but that you make up in your mind that I can be available for my own healing, for my mind to think the way that it was wired to think and for me to operate and function the way that I was designed by God to uh, operate and function based on truth and not based on religious lies or based on mm -hmm. social, social economic conditioning that has caused you to think you only deserve a certain um you know, re reality, when in all actuality, you can walk fully in what God has set forth for you. But anyway, these these are, you know, just some of the layers and levels that we're actually seeing, you know, um, that what racism, hatred, you know, what uh, the conditioning of, of being inferior or uh, conditioning of, of the superiority of the consciousness of a whole has caused. You know, and, and, and so when you think about how well we walk it out and how well we tolerate it, we think, you know, we think we're just strong, but in our actuality, we're surviving and nobody's actually really healing. Mm, 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 mm. Margaret, speak on the importance of the conversation in, in sharing your, your truth. Like for instance, Rhonda, she she didn't get to ask, but what is your what what is what what is a it, you could say to someone that has questions about you know strange activity or just strangeness in the family when you question you know if the person has split personalities or whatever. Um, and of course, you know the history of the of the racism piece. Mm -hmm. I do believe that racism does play a role in the root of the mental condition in the black community. I'm not a therapist. I don't have that as a fact. I just that's my opinion. It's the truth. Based off of the inf some information that even Dr. Holly just communicated. And then of course. Uh, as a confirmation to uh, 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 Anita's story was as a confirmation to my own personal opinion because her mom couldn't even stand to look at that stuff, which you know, which is a part of us. So it's like she could have experienced some things, you know, that traumatized her, or just witnessed some things. So you you talk to the black community right now and um, communicate to us how racism realistically does play a role in the mental illness in the black community. Even if we didn't experience it, uh, some, some, some things, uh, we could have witnessed or stories even that has been told by family members uh, that traumatized us or something happened to people that we love and 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 that was big enough. It's like naturally, like I have grandchildren. They have, don't know anything about racism and they don't like, gee, mama, I don't want to look at that. It's like they naturally know, like that's not right. You know, and they begin to form an opinion about the opposite color. Like they're mean. You know what I'm saying? Why they do that to us? It's like, you know, that you begin to, even at a young age, you begin to form to some type of guard and protection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's like the mental, you know what I'm saying? You, you absolutely do. Um, so I, I'll speak to the overall piece. Please. And I agree with Dr. Holly. Um, you know, we have just layers and layers upon layers of trauma that has been unmanaged. Um, you know, Dr. Joy DeGruy, I think I say her name every week, but she literally has, she made it her life's work to study it. So, you know, you want to go by post-traumatic slave syndromes right there in the 300 and some pages, you know, she spells it out as she can for the community. Um, but again, this has been a life's work for a lot. Um, a lot of our scholars, a lot of those that are now living, you know, you'll still see how they are talking about how racism has affected our psyche. Race is a construct. So what I mean by that is we made that up. Somebody decided one day, let's split up everybody. It's like a caste system, but like, let's split everybody up by labeling and we will create a minority. So we have to keep them down. Every time they get to a particular level, 
we got to knock them back down because we created that so that we have to create an ism to control it. And so there's this schism. That's what we know about in the black church, right? So there's this mm-hmm. schism and the racism. And so we have to do this in order. And we have to also make it where they are so marginalized that they cannot access particular things. So I don't want people to think that black people are the only ones right now that like look like they're losing it. White people are losing it too because right. they don't understand through their whiteness and that lens of whiteness. Like, how did we get here? Because the the minority is fighting back through this emotional illness. Uh-huh. And so, but we have blended a lot. So mental illness are something that's going to affect your brain, where your brain is not functioning well, whether it's you're in a depressed state, whether you're anxious, whether you actually are sitting in something that is major depression, or you're sitting in something that is um, schizophrenia, something that is psychosis. We, that that is all going to stem from some level of breaking um something that has pressed you down mm-hmm. and so with that the, we have taken that as a badge of honor the more i'm pressed the higher i'll go you know mm-hmm. even even i still call it my first lady but uh michelle obama even said yeah. you know they go low we go high i mean we're going to take this oppressed state but even she stated the depressed days when nobody saw her. So she created something. She started, she goes to the gym at 5 a.m. every day, I think is what she said in her book. Because on the depressed days, Barack wasn't there, the kids wasn't there. I got to figure out how to do this when people calling me a monkey. That's the first thing I see when I wake up in the morning. Do you know how that destroyed her psyche? This brilliant mm-hmm. woman that has attended Princeton and Harvard <laughs> as a lawyer. Like she said her psyche was destroyed, destroyed when the first meme you see in the morning, when you just trying to probably open the Bible app, I'm going to get that to her is you a monkey how did you get that so here we are because i'm gonna transition this is black people when you see the images it's trauma porn like and so you kids kids build i love working with children when i get an opportunity Mm -hmm. they build something immediately their brain says no not right that's right people who have serious mental health conditions will tell you in a minute cannot watch i can't let my eyes see that because it's going to trigger me because i don't know how to respond to it i don't have enough of inner protection to not let my eyes hold it in my brain so i'm just uh-huh. gonna watch it i love watching little kids say no i'm not gonna do it yeah i naturally do it i promise you you i'm not gonna do it they're mean they know what that feels like they can feel that energy yes there. but for those who are mature and think they're normal we just keep scanning through it on facebook like oh did you see that the picture of emmett teal in the cast Girl. We murder it Girl. on his birthday and on his death day, and Girl. it is all over your timeline. No man, watch watch your anger level on Emma Till's birthday and death day. You have a bad day at work. Why? Because on every other swipe is him in that casket, and mm-hmm. you're like, oh my god, that's been like that for me for like ten years. Like Emma Till's birthday and death day, I'm like, oh, I can't, and I I, I stay off because I get angry, and so here we are with mental illness, emotional illness. That emotional space is coming from this break that's leading to this mental space. Then it is carried through. Now, what has happened for women? Uh, women have carried a lot. And there's no issue with men. I'm not dogging black men. But black women have, have carried so much of the weight that they break. And you watch them break before men. And so what you see with men is men will become avoidant. They will just not be, they will disappear. And not because they want to, women. So I hope y'all can hear me tonight. It's because they cannot take the burden of it. I don't know how to protect you. So I'm just going to disappear and go. I'm going to use drugs. I'm going to have a lot of sex. I'm going to overeat. I'm going to stay at the gym 10 hours. I'm just going to be avoidant because I don't know how to deal with the weight of this. I'm going to come. I'm going to take my sadness and turn it into anger. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to care. And then what do women do, especially Black mothers, who take on the weight? You will take it on real quick. And so what we see is health condition. So that break starts to look like heart problems. So it's like high blood pressure. Mm. You get rising cancer for black women. You, you start to see it. I mean, even down to eye problems, hearing problems. I mean, it starts to show up because yeah. that's what we've taken on. That's why I said that's an emotional illness mm-hmm. that because mm-hmm. our body thematically begins to create the physical problem and it's, mm-hmm. it becomes real. So now you see us over medicated. Mm-hmm. So then you might see that woman that just breaks. And here's the schizophrenic moment. Probably really brilliant. All there. And what you see is a lot of people, especially in black church, they'll say it's a spirit. I'm not going to disagree with pastors. They can hear this tonight. It might be. 
It absolutely might have been demonic. But the demonic piece of it is how much we let people carry when we see them breaking. That itself is evil. And so what happens? We don't speak to them. We let them go. We know the weight is on and we don't say anything. And so when they break, now it's a demon. No, we had an opportunity because we have eyes to see that that thing was coming. And so like Dr. Holly said, it's so many examples of mental illness in the Bible, but we make it so deep and spooky yeah. that we try to call it out. Moses, I tell people in a minute, I said in this book, Mo- Moses was bipolar by definition. And beat us mm. down. This Come man on. beat a rock down because he was so angry. His mood swung all the time. One minute Moses was like, I'm gonna hold we got it. Next minute he's killing somebody. Mm-hmm. Next minute he's like, we're gonna get it done. Next minute he's throwing down the tablets. Next minute, okay, let's just do it. What happened though? When Moses found out he was adopted after he was grown and realized that did that did people it. that did it. Like, oh, did, did I just did I hit my brother one day? what like he had to gather all of that in the moment they were letting him know so the woman who raised me is not my mama but the woman who fed me is my, my and he could no longer stand watching his people he couldn't be do it. so guess it what happened like, oh, no. he started cycling like how did this happen so i mean i literally studied this in school i'm like oh i see it he started to cycle because like, i don't know how to catch up like i gotta i'm gone and so for him not to be able to walk into the promised land i don't know if that was a blessing or a curse for him because I literally led people that I used to hurt. I don't know how to do that. You know, the woman who who was possessed, we try to make her a whore. That's not what it says. It says she had seven, it's, she, she was possessed by seven demons in the in the clinical definition in the DSM, that's gonna be called schizophrenia. <laughs> you yeah, so why do we demonize it when we see this in our church? She, she wasn't Lack a whore. Lack of knowledge, honey. She, yeah, you know, so she she had a mental illness and Jesus had to comment. So that's why I'm like, some stuff, I'm not going to knock pastors when you want to demonize it, but understand how to bring it back so we can get people help because you're demonizing current people when we can help them. You see, Paul had to pray. I love what Dr. That thorn, said. Yeah, that yeah. thorn in his side, the, Paul yeah. was depressed about that. Realize he said grace is sufficient. Mm-hmm. When you see your congregant depressed, mm-hmm. Don't just throw a scripture at him. Ask, what happened to you? Paul told us what happened to him. And then he said, and God said, I'm not going to remove it, though. You're going to have to learn how to live with it. So some of these things we have, we have to learn how to live with them. And then Paul created community for himself to live with it. Y'all see how he wrote the letters. I'm telling you what's wrong with me. I'm telling you what's wrong with me. And community, I need you to support me in this thorn. So like what happens when we start to do that in our honest paul paul was so depressed he talked so much a little boy fell out the window and died paul <laughs> did not grieve that moment he went down there breathe life back into the boy and kept talking that's a disconnect <laughs> y'all that's that's an emotional issue what happens to our children when we disconnect from them the little boy fell out the window and died paul breathe life back into it went back to preaching it did not say and he stopped to recognize it. Paul had an issue with disconnect. He wasn't dramatic about it. He wasn't. And so what happens when we see this disconnect? Jesus, Jesus is sitting in a point of depression. Go read the definition for what was that sweat and blood mix moment coming out of those pores. It was literally a medical condition caused by stress. I believe it. He was going to the cross. I knew it. Going to the cross. Oh, our, our perfect Lord and Savior, guess what he was dealing with? This matter of anxiety and stress. How many of us deal with that and we don't want to tell anybody? Mm-hmm. Jesus himself is in the garden talking to the best the best person he could and say, can you take this from me? So, I, again... Everybody spiritualized everything, Margaret, now. That, 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 that's what we, we have come to know. You know, but we can we can bring the human touch to it. Because we the need to. Inspired by God, written by man. That means a human wrote it. So, what do we do with that? What happens when mothers are grieving? You know, you got in, in Kings where the woman lost her son and looked for the prophet. You promised me this little boy, you're going to bring him back to life. When mothers are acting hysterical, what happened to you? That was a hysterical moment. She got on the chariot, told her servant, take me to this man. Mm-hmm. What happens when hysterical moments are happening with Black mothers in grief? Like, because women take it on. Like, and, and we do some crazy stuff to try to deal with it. But that's because that's all we know. And men, most of the time, you'll find to be avoidant. And so for women, I, I invite them to sit with this stuff. Like, hey, what is that piece of me that I'm trying to hide so that I have to remain strong? Because your tears aren't weakness. It's, it's time to have a conversation. To keep going to another space. So 
for women and men, you know, black people have carried all this weight and we we sit and break. So when you rec- mm-hmm. when you think that you recognize something mentally wrong, ask them what happened, ask them do they need anything versus, oh, look at that. No, right. ask. And and don't do it so open that it's embarrassing. Right. Like pull pull your brother over, pull right. your sister over and say, "Is there anything I can help you with?" Right. Because I see that you're different today, and that's not wrong. I just want to know what happened to you. And that's how we can start to tackle this thing in our community, so that we can break the stigma of getting mental health services. Right. We can break it. We don't be spiritual, but be common sense too. The Bible tells you to be an even based mind. <laughs> Don't be so spiritual that you cannot be on this earth. I think old folks said it best. You got so much, you got so much sense, you ain't got common sense or something to that. <laughs> that you know, you just doing too much. Okay, our time is dwindling down. I think we got like eight minutes. So this is where I'm gonna break break up. I want to know from you, uh, Rhonda, what are you gonna do moving forward now that you understand your position? How are you going to uh, uh help other women because that's your goal you love that so how are you going to use this thing here moving forward you know when it comes to reaching other women you're going to be able to recognize immediately a condition an emotional mental you know condition so how are you going to move forward you know and being able to bring a resolve and helping the people to to get help um i i think you know God has me on a, a journey of um, using transparency as the conduit to connection and to continue to um, be bold about the things that I've, that I've gone through and know that, that it was for a purpose. You know, it, 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 it was my story, it was my mom's story and sharing those things to help others feel comfortable and asking the questions, how can I serve you? Because I think sometimes we have it all together as, you know, as professionals, but we forget that it's not a one size fit all. So, you know, as I connect with women and and I, you know, have my group chats and um, my life coaching sessions, you know, find out individually, how can I help you? If if you don't think I'm the person for you, I can find someone that can, you know what I'm saying? And being honest that, uh, like Dr. Holly said, it, that situation may be above my pay grade, but it, it's something that I'm not going to allow you to walk in shame with it and removing the shame, removing the shame of, of abuse, removing the shame of mental illness and um, poverty and all that. We are human and we're all having a human experience and I'm not going to judge you, you know, and so I just think to continue to be transparent and um, serving with an open heart is going to be one of the tools that God is going to use to help heal you. Good stuff. Amen. Now, Dr. Holly, I want you to, uh, within you know a couple of minutes, because I want to spread out the minutes, uh, tell us what it is that you feel the breakdown is for pastors that are committing suicide in the black community? That's Jesus. Uh, that's a heavy question. And mm-hmm. um, and I have a heavy answer. And I know everyone may not may or may not agree Man, with it. Listen, we want the truth. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality of it is, is most people don't have the level of depth in their intimacy with God that we have the opportunity for. The, the truth of the matter is, is that most people operate the relationship from a compartmentalized Uh, Christianity from an American Christianity versus actually having depth a pursuit for intimacy a real motive driving their pursuit for God that makes them open that opens their will and makes them available for real intimacy and in that level of real intimacy God wants to reveal your truth to you your truth you know not just the truth of who he is and but your truth is supposed to be revealed to you in that and that is a big piece of healing that is a big piece of becoming whole a lot of people are broken and they're functioning out of this pretense, this surface mm-hmm. level relationship. Um, and, and, and they, they can navigate religion, a religious consciousness as well, but they fail to really make the deeper connection. Oh my goodness. Okay. Dr. Margaret, I need for you to take that. And because th- that is just so much truth in what he just stated. Now that was, 
the clergy and the men on the man's perspective, but see there are women breaking down too. Women leaving their husbands to continue to preach and say, "Well, I didn't sign up for this." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So give us, you know, and remember, we getting close. We got three minutes. So give me um, uh, maybe one and a half minutes, you know, in sharing what the breakdown with women, the heaviness, because sometimes the women, they are the, they, they got all the children that they're bringing to church and taking care of. And it's like a lot of times pastors go on without them and leave them at home to get the kids ready to bring them to church. And it's just a boatload of stuff, a boatload of reasons. It is. I think for women, you know, women have an out. Women have this diversion and they have this distraction called children parenting, being a woman. Um, and so we're all sitting in this this bowl of hurt. Um, I believe that men, on the other hand, are given this past that, in my opinion, sometimes they don't even want. But we don't ask them to come in and join into this pain. We separate the pain because that's what we've been taught to do. Mm. And so if we can come back as a collective and start to reflect and sit in those spaces of morality and spirituality and say, hey, what is missing and what has happened to us, just like what has happened to you, then we can see how women can start to distribute some of that weight and we can share it as a collective. And so in my opinion, women carry, because that's what we've been taught to do, women right. bear because that's what we are supposed to be able to do. And for my women who cannot bear, we even bear the issue of not being able to have because it's put upon us that we can't and we are dysfunctional. And so in that space, women have always been in this space for the last 400 years, not always, the last 400 years that we are the carriers and the bearers and the birthers of that thing, which is supposed to build and carry. And men are supposed to hit and take and be beaten upon so that they can continue to build and carry. The one mm -hmm. thing that we have in common is that we are designed to build and carry. And so what is it if we can come together and realize that we have the power and the potential to build and carry together, even through this emotional pain, so that we don't continue to break and have emotional mental health problems. We maybe can stop it before and we can be proactive. So I invite us to start reflecting in spaces. And for those of us who are already suffering with issues, like ADHD is something that's unannounced. I made sure to put myself out the other day on Facebook because it's something I've been diagnosed with. Um, you have depression, you have anxiety. How are we coping in our communities? Are we eating a lot of sweets to manage certain things? Are we drinking to manage our depression? Because drink alcohol is a depressant. Are we taking stimulus? What are we doing? And if we could sit down, I, encourage, I even invite churches and other black entities and, and those that are watching tonight, create the conversation. Um, so that we can move into a space of healing and preventing the stigma. How do we manage our grief? How do we manage our mental health? How do we do this so that we as a collective can start to see what oppression has done to us so we can overcome the oppression and move into what is we want to call promised land for African Americans? We need more time. <laughs> we need more time. This is always so, so good and i pray that we help somebody if it's just one person that we help every time we do this then we've done our job don't y'all agree that's why yeah. i want to thank everyone for tuning in today to you know i'm not okay but why and to announce to you it's okay not to be okay because if you don't announce that you're hurting you cannot be healed you have to reveal your pain or that place of hurting so that you can heal. I'm Coach Deb. Thank you, Dr. Margaret. Thank you, Dr. Holly. Thank you, Rhonda Anita. Until next time, Facebook family, take care. Love everybody and be an example. Good night.